Welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. I'm Mark Rudin, and we're building the Catalina Wherry. In the last episode, we thought we had our design done. Well, it seems we had some slight failure to communicate. Let's check it out. In um, the last video, we managed to get this uh, design down to this version where I had basically five planks, uh, two top sides, two underneath the counter of the transom, and then a single garboard plank. And I thought we were all honky-dory. And uh, the thing of it is, is our client Joe, he, he's actually a, a merchant mariner. He was off, went off on the ship just as I got this done, or just before I got this done, really. He sort of liked where the design was and we decided to make a few characteristic changes. And then I launched into doing this version, which is version number five, actually put out our video about doing it, and then he sent me a text. He just hit Hawaii or something like that, and managed to check up on his emails. And he said, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't want five planks, I wanted seven planks. Okay, no problem. So we had a little miscommunication there. And unfortunately, I had already done up the five plank version, which is the one that we saw the video of. So I had to go back and redraw it. So I went back and revised our drawing, came up with our seven plank version here, this would be version number six. And just as I sort of got done this, I was like, you know, there's something about this that is bugging me. Remember how in the last episode I mentioned creating a master grid underlay in order to help prevent dimensional creep? Yep, that would have been smart. And so I sat down and I started uh, measuring a few things and I realized that we had slowly but surely kind of ballooned beyond some of the basic dimensions we started out with and we had grown from what was supposed to be like a four foot wide boat to something that's like uh um, like four and a half feet wide and it's just like little tiny like we'll tweak the line here we'll tweak the line there and it kept growing and growing and so i thought i decided i was going to stop and just back up back up and start from scratch Put away version number six and started on version number seven. Now I've got our arrangement plan on here, which is what I was going to talk about. But let me just peel that back for a second. So version number seven, we've uh, gone back to basically the original scheme. I think I've recreated the transom that Joe wanted. We've shrunk that beam back down to it's, it's actually just a little over four feet. It's, it's four feet, two inches. Squeeze the transom down a little bit because it had slowly widened out a little bit too much as well. I think I got the bilges down a little slacker. They were getting a bit, a bit full in the bilges. And so it's a little more rounded now. And uh, I played around with the shear just a little tiny bit too, because it was feeling a bit funny the way it was. So anyway, I, uh, so we got back, we got to this version, version number seven. <laughs> this is it. We're not changing the lines anymore. And so I thought I'd talk about the arrangement plan. The interior of this boat is going to be kept fairly simple. So we've got uh, a thwart riser, of course, running all the way through. We're going to do three basically sawn frames or they'll be laminated. Uh, running through the midship of the boat close to the rowing stations. One center thwart that's actually, Joe wants one that's like really deep. So we're making this like 16 inches wide, which is crazy wide compared to most boats, which usually have thwarts of about like nine inches wide a lot of the time, or even less. But Joe likes a big comfy seat and he likes to put a padded cushion on there. So he requested this big wide seat. So we're going to put that in, and then he wants just a single station uh, for rowing forward, but doesn't want a thwart there all the time. So what we came up with is basically a, f a seat frame, much like you would have in a canoe, and a panel that sits on top of that that is the seat. And so when Joe wants the forward seat, he lifts the panel off of that frame, and it will fit into the forward position, leaving the framework in behind. Now to the outboard sides of whatever width we need for that front seat, we're just gonna have a couple of little shelves built into the seat frame. So they're gonna sit, the shelves will sit down below the frame, the panel will sit on top of the frame, and the frame is basically like hardwood one by twos or something like that. And so that's gonna give Joe an ability to move that seat when he needs it, and he'll 
have a little bit of this little shelf unit, which is basically like storage for like a water bottle and binoculars or whatever it is that Joe needs to keep readily at hand, his sandwich or gummy bears or whatever. So the thwart, thwart riser is fastened to our frames, our three frames. And then, but to carry it through the full length, and Joe wants it running as long as possible, and he likes to use it for handholds, we're just going to make up like little lugs, sort of like a short section of frame that will fasten in, in between these locations in order to carry that, that rub rail or that, sorry, that thwart riser. Now we're going to put a second riser down low, just above the floorboards, uh, smaller in scale, but it, that's going to be basically for lashing stuff too. So we will, again, use lugs to fasten that in place. And that's because Joe wants to put uh, flotation in there and he wants to fasten it down low along the sides of the boat and so he needs something to fasten that too so he'll have lashing points between the thwart riser and this lower rail. Then we're going to do floorboards that are going to drop down into place. They're going to sit in between the frames, probably run level out towards the ends of the boats but they might run, uh, I might elevate them but we'll see what we can do about that. And then Joe likes a really deep breast hook Apparently he likes to step onto the breast hook first when he gets into the boat off of a dinghy dock. So give him a breast hook that's like a, a full 12 or 14 inches deep. And we're going to have quarter knees back here that actually wrap all the way around and bridge across the transom. So that's going to increase the uh, strength across the transom and really tie those two sides together nicely. Instead of uh, painter rings being bolted in, we're going to do just holes through the planking uh, behind the stem up forward and holes through the transom underneath the quarter knees. So he can run a bridle off the transom for dragging a drogue in, in rough weather. And, uh, he, or he can run an anchor through the, uh, through the planking and around the back of the stem if he wants. And then we're going to put a false shoe on the bottom probably solid hardwood, probably oak or something like that, that I'm likely put in place either with epoxy or with um, flexible polyurethane. And the idea there is that we've just got a, a really tough bottom that can take a lot of abuse without having to worry about damaging anything that water can get into. So it'll be like maybe three eighths of an inch of oak or something which could take a real pounding. And um, if it were fiberglass, for instance, yeah, you could build up the fiberglass, but you're always worried about that. When that thing finally wears through someplace and then the water is getting into the core of your, your bottom, which is gonna be plywood. So we'll be uh, eliminating that problem. And in fact, we'll probably glass over the garboards and bottom in one piece, just like I did with the Bushi Dory and that's mostly to put glass onto the garbage themselves, but if I'm glassing that, I might as well carry it right the way across. Unless I decide to glass the planks before installation, I haven't uh, decided on that. We'll glue on that hardwood bottom, and should it need repairs, you do that by doing Dutchman, or you, uh, you could just shave the whole thing down to the power plane and reskin it with more hardwood. So that's where we're at. I'm ready to loft because I've got my offsets done. I'll set up my lofting board and we'll get cracking on this one. When I use the term lofting, I'm referring to two different things, but they're really the same thing. In the first case, I'm referring to the process we use of creating a drawing of our boat with three different views. If done accurately, we can create a set of coordinates from those views that we call a table of offsets. Let's take a quick look at the table of offsets and how we record that. A table of offsets is really a numerical chart that plots out all of the intersections that our boat has uh, in its relationship to a grid that we create. So we have station lines, and in many cases we have water lines too. We have a baseline, we have a center line. I'm not using any water lines in this particular boat because uh, we're using the plank lines themselves, which certainly adds a complication to working up the lines on here. And that's because none of these lines are straight. We've got them curved in two different directions and I need to make sure they all juggle together to uh, coordinate and look good. In fact, they gotta look good in three different directions. They gotta look good in the profile, they've gotta look good in the half breadth, and then they've also gotta look good in our plan view or our body plan. So everywhere that one of these elements crosses another element, 
we create an offset. And so that's what I'm doing right now. I'm going through the grid here, basically one station at a time, and I'm picking off the half breadths of each plank line as it crosses that station, and I'm picking off the heights of each plank line as it crosses uh, each station. And the heights are above a baseline. Half breadths are from a center line. There's a system of nomenclature that we use when we're creating half breadths. And the standard nomenclature is referring to each of these intersections in the form of a number of feet, a number of inches, and a number of eighths of an inch. Because, of course, in the imperial system, eighths of an inch is sort of a very convenient uh, size to use. And some will actually go down to sixteenths or thirty seconds. Sixteenths is as really accurate as you need to get because uh, often that's like the thickness of your pencil line when you're working on a full-size lofting. It's a very fast way of being able to write something down uh, quickly and simply that's easy to read and hard to misunderstand. And you could call it out across a room if you're doing it, uh, if you're lofting a very large boat and you had one person reading out offsets and another person uh, marking them down on a lofting floor, you need some way to, to communicate that in a very clear way that doesn't get fuddled up in if it's a noisy environment of a shipyard, for instance. So anyhow, I'm working at the offsets for this particular uh, boat here still, and so I'm gonna work on station three. And if I lay my scale along here, I've already done my shear plank. I'm looking at the half breadth of the next plank lap down. So uh, here I've got one foot, so I can put that down, one. And then I got uh, eight inches. Eight inches and then we look at the portions of an inch and this is where it gets a little trickier because we switch to something we're not used to thinking about so the number of eights in this case um, it looks like I, I land just above four eights but not five eights so I would say four and then we use a plus sign to indicate a little bit more or a sixteenth more and sometimes people don't use plus signs. Sometimes they'll use they'll go up to the next number and use a minus sign. But I use a plus because we use these little, uh, we often have a little dash between numbers. So that can get confusing if you use minuses as well. So then I go down to the next plank and we get one foot again. And now we are at, uh, let's see. So you know what? I, I messed up. This one was the, the 184 right here. 184 plus. This is what happens when you're trying to do too many things at once. So get rid of that. This guy is 110. And not quite an eighth, so I would say zero plus. Go down to the next one down. Uh, this one, this one, this one, now we're here. So we are one, five, and this looks like it's like three quarters, so that's six. One, five, six eighths. Next one down is one, three, and nothing, so one, three, zero. And then I've got to drop my scale down here for the last one. And so now I know I get zero because I don't have any more full feet. And six. And it looks like six again. So simple as that. And it's a lot easier if you can imagine than convert from feet to all inches or inch, feet and inches and fractions. So this just brings it down to a very simple method. I really like the system. Uh, it works well. Little room for making mistakes. So long as you can quickly in your head switch from thinking about you know, quarters of an inch or three quarters or half an inch to the number of eighths within each of those divisions. Now the second use of the term lofting refers to taking that table of offsets and redrawing the boat full size on the loft floor. And that's what we're going to do in the next episode. So please join me again. I want to thank you all for watching, and I want to thank everybody on Patreon who helps support this channel. And if you can help me out on Patreon, I really appreciate that. You can find links in the corner or down in the description. 
So until next time, get out in the workshop, get your hands dirty, have some fun. I'll see you later, folks.